Hello, and welcome to the Southern California Writers Association, known as SCWA, the oldest literary group in California. We trace our roots back to the Hopi Indian wall paintings. And let me tell you, we have some, you've joined up, if you haven't been here before, with a shady group of people with reputations that are not of the best. We are thieves, thugs, murderers, buggerers. Why? Because we're writers, and those people inhabit our stories. So um, they're there, and we're all members of that group, and writers have been the recorders of, his of human history since time began. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And maybe you ask, why the ugly? Because it sells, and uh, sells, Mortimer. So we do record everything. We are writers, and uh, we're a wonderful group of writers. Uh, we are committed. Our mission is to working and helping writers improve their craft and sell their books. And since uh, we've started the organization, and uh, it has done almost everyone in the group has published and is working on publishing. So uh, we're pretty, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful day, wonderful group. And that's who you've joined today, a group of rogues, and uh, we're happy to be together with you. a wonderful day planned to you. You know, um, this the group, SCWA, we do have a, um, I just want to ask our Vice President, Maddie, to just share quickly. We have um, a Wednesday meeting. Tell Maddie what it's called, Maddie, and maybe uh, um, Diana can put that up on the screen, but it's called Hump Day. And Maddie, just share what we do every Wednesday. Uh, well, thank you, Larry. Every Wednesday morning, the Southern California Writers Association turns our Facebook group page over to a new writer to introduce themselves and their work. They have um, 15 minutes to talk to us about their book. Um, this upcoming Wednesday, we welcome Christopher Reich, um, who will join us at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. And if you can't join us then, you can um, see the interview on Facebook or find it later on our YouTube channel. That's right. We do have our stuff, everything going up on a YouTube channel. So please. Diana, do, yeah. <laughs> thanks please. to Diana Pardee. I had to jump that. Go ahead. Thanks to Diana. Please put uh, uh, take a look at our YouTube channel. And if you've missed anybody and subscribe, it's free and you'll be supporting a, a group of wonderful people and wonderful writers. So um, we're honored for that today. Uh, we do have a, you see Maddie shared, she can share again at the end. We, our sister organization lit up and wonderful writers that come in and read from uh, everywhere. And um, a month ago, uh, she did one at the Museo in Anaheim and it was so successful. They have another one coming this uh, the Sunday, the 30th, which she can share again later. We also have uh, wonderful speakers coming up. And um, you know what, we had a sp our last live speaker was Raymond Obsfeld who is the writing partner for Kareem Jabbar. And they have a TV series coming uh, that they just finished re wrote it, writing. Uh, they had done one um, about a year ago and it was had to do with um, uh, black uh, Americans who served in the Revolutionary War. And they have one now, uh, a reference a TV show for the History Channel for black Americans that have served in the Civil War. And he and Kareem have offered to come and share part of it with us. So that will be exciting sometime this fall for us to do that also. Um, we are just uh, excited that everything, so many things have been happening and the people have been calling to just come and appear. So Maddie, thank you. know, we have our meetings here, but we record them, put them up online and you get 500, 600, a few thousand people that look at them. So it's kind of wild to realize some of them. And that's all you as members. And um, we thank everybody for being part of that. Um, today, we are welcoming a wonderful, fabulous person that uh, I have known for many years. And, and is everybody comfortable? Make sure you're comfortable because you might have a coffee, you know, something like that for yourself. You know, this also makes if you're sitting at a table, you want to put your head down, you can lean on this. It's very, very comfortable. Uh, you may want that. You may also not be too early for you to have some of this, you know, and please feel free to pour your home. And uh, we thank you. But our, <laughs> it'll help you enjoy everything. 
um, you know, they gave it in communion early in the morning. So what the heck? Why not at home at, at home? So uh, here we are. Today we have a wonderful speaker, and I'm going to hold up her book. It's uh, Stacy Evans Morgan is welcome. I've known Stacy for many years, and I'm honored that she would be here. And uh, she is known in the industry, so well noted, and uh, has worked on so many shows. She's a veteran of a television writer and producer. She's worked on uh, Love That Girl. Uh, in fact, uh, she, when she was producing Love That Girl, several of us from the writer group, we were allowed to come down on the set, and we visited the set while they were shooting. And it was quite a, quite a great, uh, fun time to watch the scenes go off in that little cozy room, living room, and in the hallway near the elevator. It was uh, pretty, pretty cool to see what a set is and everything else like that. She's also been on Family Time, The Parkers, One on One, The Jamie Foxx Show, Meet the Browns, House of Pain. Um, she's done NAACP Image Awards. Um, but most in, she works also right now with DreamWorks with their uh, morning television show as a writer. And um, she just finished a movie of her own, 21 Days of April. And uh, that movie was, wasn't it just taken, uh, asked to be a part of the LA Film Festival, is that correct? Yes, sir. And um, just a phenomenal story, uh, movie, and it's a short film, but it'll be in the, uh, also the Black Film Festival there. Mm -hmm. So uh, she uh, uh, speaks in residence at the Delaware State, Howard University, and currently is a professor, age of professor at Chapman University. So uh, she's a writer and has so many things to share, and she runs a wonderful, phenomenal, uh, creative writing, um, creative screenwriting, and just writing um, seminar every so often, and about four times a year, and it's called uh, Creative Leap, and um, I took it uh, during this pandemic, and I'll tell you, you the, the least you're going to come away with, which you will today also, is inspiration, and you'll want to get to the keyboard or to a pen and pen. You're going to want to write something immediately even if it's a check to pay your bills, but you're going to want to do that. <laughs> so you will be there and uh, it will inspire you. But, but I do, Stacy's also a friend, a mother, a wife, and uh, I don't, she juggles so many things with uh, so many things so wonderfully and uh, faces adversity um, with a smile all the time. So um, we've shared some tender moments and it's just been great knowing her. So I introduce you, ladies and gentlemen, Stacy Evans Morgan. Welcome her. Yay! Thank you. Stop the applause. It's so loud. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Welcome to uh, Saturday with uh, SCWA. I'm honored to be back here. I guess it's been about seven years since the last time I've seen most of you all. So I'm really honored. I was honored to be invited by Larry. And um, Maddie, you guys have been great coordinating this whole thing. And I, first of all, want to give a shout out to some of my creative leapers who are in the room. Larry just referenced. So um, I'm going to put you guys back on gallery. Um, yeah, so I think we have a couple of people in the room that just took the creative leap at my recent uh, workshop. Uh, we have Karen from Michigan. We have Lena from California. We have a couple of people. So I'm really, I'm in good company. But I'm honored to be here. Um, you know, we're all shut in and, and you know, we, have, we are a captive audience. <laughs> we are each other's captive audience. So I, I appreciate you being here to listen to whatever I have to say today. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share screen. I'm going to guide along because, you know, who wants to just sit up and just see me talking. So at least let me give you some interesting visuals to go along with my journey. So thank you for that wonderful intro, Larry. That was really wonderful. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen and getting used to this. So hopefully, oh, hold on. can you all see that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so let me go ahead and put it in full view because I wanna talk today about being a writer in 2020. So, um, writing in the year 2020, what a crazy time that we're living in, right? So this is an unprecedented year of pandemic and epidemic uh, civil injustice. So 
writers, we have a wonderful obligation. We have an obligation to tell our stories, to write history and her story as it's happening for posterity's sake. So it's something that I like to encourage writers through this time. Let's write our visions. Uh, you know, I feel like future generations will study society by the way of our written word. So we as writers, we must chronicle, we must chronicle every event as we are experiencing it um, in real time. So write your books, write your scripts, write your poetry, write your songs, your essays, your short stories. And I'm in great company because that's what you do. So I'm so happy to be among other writers. So um, let me just make this quick adjustment. Okay, so, but today I wanna talk about reinventing yourself as a writer. So over my 30 years as primarily a television writer, I have done some screenwriting. I have been a playwright as well. I'm an author and we'll talk about that. Um, I've had to reinvent myself many times. I've had to reinvent myself um, so that I could stay employed, so that I could basically answer the call of the muse that is in all of us. Um, so basically just not limiting myself, but reinventing myself has really afforded me a lot of wonderful opportunities. Uh, it has opened doors that I've never imagined. The scripture, there's a scripture that tells us that our talents make room for us and bring us before great men and women. And that is true because look at this room that I'm in right now. Give, your, give yourselves a round of applause. I mean, you all are great men and women in talent. So, you know, I'm in good company. And I like to just say, basically, get out of the comfort zone and get out of your own way. So, as Larry mentioned, uh, I've had the great fortune to write for television for a little bit over 30 years. Um, I had the opportunity to work as a staff writer. I got hired on a show called The Parkers, starring the Academy Award winning uh, Monique. I like to say I was a little pebble on her road to the Academy Awards. But anyway, um, I was fortunate to land my first staff writing gig and for it to be a five year uh, opportunity was just amazing. So I worked for five seasons as a writer, and then I worked my way up from story editor, executive story editor, uh, co-producer to producer. And 110 uh, episodes later, there you go, I was a producer. Um, and most recently, about a week ago, we got some really good news. Christmas came in July because we found out that the Parkers, along with seven other iconic Black um, sitcoms, are now coming to Netflix. So as you can see, Netflix has acquired uh, the Parkers, The Game, Sister Sister, One on One, Girlfriends, Moesha, and I, and One on One, and I'm so, so proud to be uh, to have made history on one of those shows. Actually, I've written for two of those shows. So that was, that's was that been my main bread and butter as a staff writer and producer. And it's, it's a vocation that I love. I feel very blessed to do what I love. But then, okay, so the Parkers, we started in 1999 and we wrapped in 2004. Then you're back out there. So now I had to reinvent myself. I had to think of ways. Now I, I, I'm working, I had worked as a freelance writer. So that was another way I wrote for the Jamie Foxx show, which I like to say my fun fact is that I've written for two Academy Award winners. That's just, you know, coffee talk. Um, and I've also written for the show One on One, which is also going to Net Netflix. So working as a freelance writer is a way I've had to shift um, my experience as a writer. Then in 2005, I totally did a 360 as a writer and tried my hand at live award show writing. And the NAACP Image Awards, that particular year, that was 2005. So we had just wrapped the Parkers probably nine months prior. And you know, as writers, you're always looking for that next job, the next opportunity. Well, I had heard that the NAACP this particular year was honoring um, a guy named, a senator by the name of uh, uh, Barack Obama, I think we know him, 
uh, Oprah Winfrey and Prince. And I just took it upon myself. I was like, I, I need to work on that show. I, I have to write for that show. And so I reached out. I took a leap of faith, a creative leap of faith. And I reached out to the executive producer of the show. And I looked up to see who was writing for the show. It was all men. And I was like, you guys need a female voice in that room. And I just took a leap of faith and I wrote a tribute to Oprah Winfrey on spec. And spec is a term that we use in TV writing where you write a speculative, speculative script um, on the speculation that it's going to get sold or that it's going to open a door for you. So I just took a leap of faith and wrote this amazing uh, tribute. I think it's amazing. And my mom said it was amazing. So it was amazing. But I wrote this tribute to Oprah Winfrey and I sent it to them. And I said, this is an example of what I could do for that show. I've never written live TV. I'd never written for an award show. I didn't even know what it all entailed, but I knew I needed to write for that show. So I reinvented myself as a writer who could write for live TV. And um, after a little persuasion, at first he said, you know, we just don't have room in the budget. And I just said, are you sure? Really think about that. And you know what, he, uh, read the, he read the tribute and he was really, really impressed. And he went back to his team at the time the show was on Fox television, on the Fox network. And he went to his team, the powers that be, and lo and behold, they found it in their budget. They found it, uh, figured out a way how they could squeeze me in on that writing staff. So I ended up writing for the NAACP Image Awards, and I wrote for about five years. There was one year in last, but it was an amazing, amazing experience. I mean, meeting luminaries such as, I mean, President Obama, Oprah. Um, didn't get to meet Prince because he had a... You couldn't get to Prince that, e that easily. Um, but Sidney Poitier, you name it, Halle Berry, all these different people. So I reinvented myself from a sitcom writer to now I was a live award show writer, right? Um, that, that experience and that relationship with that executive producer led to other opportunities, such as four years ago, this very weekend, I was right here where you see all these people in Philadelphia at the Democratic National Convention. I would have never imagined myself writing in the political arena. It was not my thing. It was not what I wanted to do. But I got a call because they had a, they had a project that they were doing a live streaming show alongside the convention called DNC Live. And it was hosted by Hill Harper. And they had a line, a long list of luminaries who were going to be coming through this little small studio suite within the convention room floor. And I was charged with writing the content. I had to write all of the content for the host. And it was really a stressful job. It was really hard. It was really, um, it was really an amazing stretch for me as a writer. But I always welcome the opportunity to grow. And so I'm, I'm glad I did it. Like I said, it was, it was extremely stressful. We were spending 12 to 16 hours in this convention room, huddled in a small, hot, sweaty, makeshift office, writer's room, production office. The food was awful. The uh, stadium was surrounded with crazy security as we, we could not leave the grounds. It was, it was just not that great but when it as it as the time as it i'm sorry as the time was winding down countdown to the actual convention then it did start getting exciting and um this was probably one of my highlights of of the opportunity let me click on here meeting this gentleman congressman john lewis and it is this picture i look horrible in this picture but i just I cherish this photo because he was such a gracious man. And as he encouraged us all, get into some good trouble. I'm all about that. So, um, so that opportunity, because I was open to it, because my spirit was open to it as a writer to not keep myself in a box, 
I accepted the opportunity and I, my life was greater. It was better. My experience was better for it. So, um, so then as, Car as uh, Larry mentioned, you know, I've had the opportunity to write on other projects for cable and streaming content. In 2007, the Writers Guild, we were on strike. And those of us who write comedy, who write in the genre of comedy, I know Maddie is a comedy writer as well, um, sitcoms went away. That was the year there were a ton of reality shows and all the studios and networks were doing dramas. And then we went on, we went on strike. And we, those of us who worked in comedy, we were out of work. Well, my brother, who is also a fellow writer and producer, um, put on his entrepreneurial hat and said, look, we've been doing this for a minute. And he had this idea to create a show. And um, that show became Love That Girl. It was, a, it was not originally called Love That Girl, but it, we wanted to get back to doing multicam, good old fashioned sitcoms. And so Tatiana Ali from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, we ended up landing her as our lead. Uh, Raphael Sadiq from the, sh from the group Tony, 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 he came on board as one of our executive producers and he also had a show called Love That Girl. Then for those of you who are old enough to remember the old Marlo Thomas series, there was also some synergy there because it was kind of like this feel good show about this single woman in the city. And so kind of, you know, we had that essence of that girl in it. And so we ended up independently producing this series. We ended up in independently produced four episodes of a show got a little bit of seed money from investors. And when I say a little, I mean a little. It was not enough that normally you would uh, spend on doing a television, a television show. But because there were so many people who were out of work, we had a lot of colleagues who were willing to come together and say, look, just deferred payment. We just want to work. And if this is going to be a project that can open up some more work for all of us, we're all down. So we all came together and put together this show. And my brother took it out to different distributors and, and networks. And this little network, cable network, TV One, which had not even been around for five years, they ended up buying the, the license. They, did, uh, they actually licensed for us to do it. And we did a deal with them that if they liked the show, that they would come back and do um, a full season for us. So we did our first 13 episodes and then we did another season. And uh, three years later, we had 65 episodes. We, we did um, 65 episodes of Love That Girl. Um, from there, we use the same model of how to produce um, projects on a low budget but with high quality. And so down in the left-hand corner, you can see Family Time starring Omar Gooding and Angel Conwell. And we did the same model with that show and ended up licensing that with Bounce TV, which was a new streaming service out of Atlanta. So streaming is, is an important thing. So family time, we are, we did started that in 2012 and it's 2020 and we have 91 episodes. So we are not less than 10 episodes away from our 100 episodes. And we're hoping that once this whole COVID crisis is over, that we'll be able to get back to work and at least round it out to a good 100 episodes. Down here in the right-hand corner, you see the, the show in the cut. This was another independent series that we did. And during this pandemic, I guess it got the attention of Forbes magazine because it was unsolic totally unsolicited by us. But Forbes, we looked up one day and Forbes had named us as one of the 10 binge-worthy titles with black and brown faces in front of the camera. So that was kind of cool. That was a really, really nice little surprise there. So reinventing yourself as this... Um, as this writer producer, um, maybe taking a cut and pay, but willing to do what you love, it was worth it. So just having that flexibility. Then uh, in 2018, so th this group of ladies, we were all featured in the Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter does an, does an issue every year, Women in Entertainment. 
Well, this particular year, a writer contacted a group that I belong to called um, BWB, Black Women Who Brunch. And it's comprised of Black women who write for TV. Basically, we the, the criteria is that you have had to have been staffed on a major show, on a major television show. And it started off as a little small gathering of maybe 12, 16 writers, just all gathering at the home of one of the, the founders. And it grew into this huge thing. And so the Hollywood Reporter reached out to us and they wanted to do a two-page photo expose and, and interview the writers because one of the things that is heard often in the industry is, well, we just can't find qualified Black writers. And so um, they wanted to do this as a photo expose, kind of as a kind of a tongue in cheek. Like there's no more, we can't find any Black female writers. We're here, our 26 beautiful uh, women of color scribes in one photo. So if you can't find what you need with in this group of women, we know other women who can do the job. And you can't really, well, you can see me, there I am in the orange jacket, that's my signature. But these women write for every show that you can think of. Grey's Anatomy, CIS, Blackish, uh, any show that you can think of, it is represented in this, for, from sci-fi to drama, all the different genres represented in this picture but this doesn't even this doesn't even scratch the surface of how many um qualified writers there are so this was a great opportunity well being a part of this group it caught the eye of some executives at dreamworks and they were very enthusiastic about diversifying their writing staff and they had a new show that they had in development called madagascar a little while from the Madagascar franchise. And so for me, I had not had experience writing an animation, but I had written a children's book and I had written family television. So this book over here, this was my first children's book, Coco Princess. So I just figured, you know, let me throw my hat in the ring. And I had my manager send the uh, electronic version of the book, um, along with one of my original samples that I had written, um, a family sitcom. And lo and behold, they called me in for a meeting. And the next thing you know, I'm getting invited to the story summits at at DreamWorks and they're fleshing out this new show that's an offspring of their franchise uh, project, Madagascar. And if you'll just oblige me for a second, let me see if I can click on the trailer. Um, Uh-oh, getting ahead of myself. Uh, let's see if we can do this. Uh, okay. Can you all see this screen? Just nod real quick. Okay. Great, let me go full screen on that. So this is the show that I just got my, uh, just cut my teeth on for animation. It's a wild, wild world and it's calling on it. It's a jungle up here, so let's get on our way to have fun. Do the tunnel, see the big, big city. Everybody get ready. So that is coming to the Peacock Network um, real soon. Uh, hopefully, I think they said uh, late fall. So really excited about that. And so let me go back to where I was. So Madagascar follows our four friends, um, four friends, but it goes back to when they first arrived in New York at the zoo as little little baby animals. And it was really a cute, cute, cute concept. It's a great concept um, using New York as the backdrop. So many fun things that we explored. So now I have my credit as I've reinvented myself now as an animation writer. And that's opening other doors because now um, 
the studios and networks are always looking for new fresh writers and fresh voices. So I've re reinvented myself yet again as a writer. Um, as Larry mentioned, um, I'm also a novelist, but I didn't set out to be a novelist like most of you. Uh, you know, I'm in the presence of some very accomplished novelists. I actually wrote a screenplay at first. I wrote a screenplay called A Good Thing. And I got, you know, some lukewarm reception. I got the attention of a producer who was excited about producing it and a couple of celebrity um, celebrities who had read it and said they would like to be a part of it. And uh, we ended up taking it over to, um, uh, where did we take it? To Lionsgate. And again, warm reception, but no real move on it. But secretly inside, my characters were talking to me and they were like this, we have more story to tell, write a book. And I had this book sitting on my shelf by Walter Mosley. And the book is called, This Year You Will Write a Novel. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and that book sat for a year. Then another year passed by and I had not written this novel. Of course I was working and everything, but um, I was a little bit intimidated by the process. But after that meeting at Lionsgate, I had this urging in me to just take a step back. And I sent the copy of the script to a dear friend of mine who is, uh, she is a definite force in the literary field, Victoria Christopher Murray. She's written, oh my goodness, over 50 novels. Literally, she is uh, with Simon and Schuster and has enjoyed a really good career as a novelist. And I sent it to her to let her read it. I just wanted to get a different take on, on my story. And she really loved it and said that um, it kind of read it like a novel. And that was kind of a confirmation for me to go ahead and take that leap of faith to step out and novelize the screenplay into um, to the novel, which you see here on the right. And Victoria, along with her partner, writing a uh, writing partner of hers, Rashonda Tate Billingsley, who was also with um, Simon Schuster, they decided to start their own um, publishing company. And they called it Brown Girls Books. And the whole idea was to give voice to more marginalized writers and, and, and women of color and even men. Um, to get their, their stories told in book form. And so lo and behold, they decided that they wanted to publish my book. And those of you who are in the group, you probably are familiar with NaNoWriMo, which is November, National Novel Writing Month. And so I decided to just take, my, take a stab at writing it through a program that was gonna encourage me throughout the month. And lo and behold, I, I took that first scene from the script and those characters came to life in, for me. They, they started speaking to me in ways they had not spoken, you know, on the pages of the script. And um, I really, really enjoyed the, the process. And so I'm looking forward to getting into more novel writing. But that was how I basically took the screenplay, which was over here. This was a synopsis and a whole breakdown of the film. And it evolved years later into this novel, which I'm really proud of. And, and um, yeah, so I think Larry's going to, they're going to make some announcements later on about that. So that was how I evolved again now as a novelist. So children's writer, children's book writer, novelist. I had also had a book of poetry published. I've written essays that have been published. So the, the, the whole idea is just to write just continue to write because there's someone out there that wants to hear your written expression. So that was a little bit about that experience. Then um, a couple of years ago, I wrote um, an anthology series um, called In Full Bloom. And I did some crowdfunding to raise some money to shoot the pilot. So I ended up shooting this one episode of this love anthology kind of inspired by the old school way of the old school way of telling story like um love american style but not as perky and crazy but i just love this idea of these different stories and and currently 
Amazon has something called Modern Love. So, you know, I knew I was on the right track. So I shot this, uh, this uh, project called In Full Bloom. And it ended up getting the attention of the folks over at Viacom at BET. And they ended up giving me a pilot deal for In Full Bloom. Okay, great. I'm on my way. I'm going to get my series on. So under this pilot deal, I'm under contract for nine months. They're paying me as a writer to, you know, massage the story, to make the changes. We're, we're going through rewrites after rewrites after rewrites. They're like, can you change it from LA to move it to middle America or down South or something? And I thought, well, New Orleans, New Orleans is a interesting uh, city. It's one of my favorite cities, very colorful and, and unique in, in her own right. And uh, so we set it in New Orleans. We did all of this. And then there's the executive shuffle that happens at studios so often. And along with that, projects get put on the shelf because now those executives who were shepherding your project are no longer there. And the new executives that are coming in, they're bringing their projects that they are passionate about. So my project was put on the shelf for about a year. And, but it was a story that I just couldn't let die. And luckily I had an ally at the network who called me and said, look, your project's just gonna sit here for another couple of years. We're releasing this back to you go forth, make some magic. And so thankfully I got the rights back to my project. And I just, the stories just kept coming to me. I was like, how can I get this project out here? And the pilot was called um, 21 Days of April. And it was one of the stories within the anthology series. So I pulled that out. There was a, there was a contest, um, a competition that came about. Um, it was a script, fe film fe a script festival. And they were looking for short stories. And so I took one of the stories that was within In Full Bloom and set it apart as its own story, 21 Days of April, as you see right here. And I finessed it into a short film script. And I submitted it, and I got accepted. I was like, okay, so I'm not crazy. <laughs> this is a good story. Well, that particular organization, their whole idea was they were gonna take 10 scripts and turn them into short films and yada, yada, yada. And so it was about a year, well, it was about six months and hadn't heard anything else. Like, what are our next steps? And finally, towards the end of the year, I had this, this idea that I'm gonna, produce this film myself. I was a writer, I was a director, I was a producer, I was resourceful. I knew how to, I could make it happen. So I decided to do a little crowdfunding last year and I raised the money to shoot my short film. And thank you, Larry was one of my contributors and he'll, you'll see his name in the credits. And we set out to shoot uh, 21 Days of April. And I pulled together a ragtag small group of really talented um, uh, crew members. Uh, my cousin had just graduated from USC's film school, got his master's and his MFA in film. And so he came on board as my producer, he was very resourceful because he was able to help me identify young talent that just wanted to work. They just wanted the experience. And so we all came together and made this really beautiful film that I really love um about basically unrequited love and what happens when the one that got away returns so lo and behold we shot this beautiful movie um hired this wonderful cast it has propelled me now into another genre of romantic drama so now i've gone from comedy to live television to animation as an author and now you know, I'm moving into this romantic drama category. And drama is something that obviously I would like to evolve into. And um, last week, we got these laurels, as you can see. Uh, I hope this is not blocking the screen. But we got these lovely laurels um, that we were ex accepted into the LA Film Festival in the um, LA Black uh, Film Festival category. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, that's supposed to happen in September, but now with all of what's going on, a lot of the film festivals are kind of 
figuring out how, how they're going to do them virtually. But it's an exciting thing nonetheless. If it's worldwide virtually, I'm still excited because we made a movie and we got it out there. And also, with this little project is now being considered at a major streaming network. I cannot um, divulge just yet, but a streaming service is um, considering putting it on their menu uh, for the fall or for the first quarter of 2021. So now there's a licensing deal that's that possibly going to happen. Uh, we're going to submit it to Sundance. I'm going to submit it to all different film festivals, but this is the first of hopefully many. So that's a little bit about that. So my encouragement to writers, I got some real inspiration this week by a fellow writer, producer, friend of mine, who after years and years and years with a project that he had, he finally landed the deal and sold this project. And it's going to be, um, I don't know if it's going to be a lifetime film, but basically they got the green light. It was in Deadline Hollywood. And this is what he said. If an idea makes you smile, laugh, or cry, never discount it. Write it. That's from Gary Hartwick. And so let that resonate. If an idea makes you smile, laugh, cry, if it makes you angry, if it provokes you, never discount it, write it. I like to say that if an idea tucks you in at night and then it snatches the covers off of you in the morning, it's meant for you to write it. It was given to you for a reason. So write the vision and listen to your characters. Um, real quick on that, and, and Larry and I were talking about characters. We're in a time where we have such a great opportunity to have really, really intentional conversations with people. We look at our neighbors. We don't know. We think we know each other, but we're just kind of passing and honking and waving, or we see each other at work or even at school or what have you, but we don't really know each other. And this is a great opportunity in our time to create characters based on the encounters that we have and really tell some real stories, some intentional stories and get to know each other's experience and not just go based on what we see on the news or, or what we see on social media. There's a lot of civil unrest. And this is an opportunity for us as writers to really come together, to network, to get to know each other, to, to learn about each other's experiences and stories and write them. So um, yeah, listen to your characters. Um, I like to say content is king. I teach a class at uh, Chapman University. We're starting, I'm starting my fourth semester. I can't believe that it's gone that fast. I, but I teach an intro to comedy writing um, class at Chapman University at their film school, Dodge College of Film and Media Studies. And uh, this is one thing, this is the mantra that I always, 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 I, I mention in every, in every class, every workshop I've ever taught, wherever I go, content is king. So it's not enough for you to just be a writer. You have to think, how can I be a content creator? How can I provide content for the masses? Because there's so many platforms. You guys have a YouTube channel. Well, your YouTube channel could get the attention of a studio executive who just happens to hear someone on there reviewing their book and that gets attention. And, and then the next thing you know, you might get that call. Like, who was that writer? We'd like to read their book. And, and then maybe they want to develop your book into a television series or into a movie. So the opportunity is there for you. There are new platforms on the horizon. Um, they, I like to say they have real estate, but they need property, which is your content. So writers are in demand more than ever. And it's, it's an exciting time. I like to encourage creatives across the board that our vocation is safe. Writers will never be replaced by robots. So, you know, write those ideas that come to you. Robots cannot uh, write books. They can't write songs. They can't write scripts. You know, artificial intelligence cannot replace your innate gift, your your inspired talent, your creativity. You can't escape the call of a writer, so just accept it. And always realize that credits and bylines don't define you. A lot of times I hear people say, I'm an aspiring writer, and but they've written, they've been writing for years, but they call themselves an aspiring writer. No, 
I like to say, I write, therefore I am. I am a writer. And the same for you. If you write, then you are a writer. So those credits and those bylines, that will come. The money, it will come. But if you're a writer, keep writing. Don't let those things define you. And let's see. So for some writers, I like to say this time of pandemic will be a defining moment. Remember, Shakespeare wrote three of his famous tragedies during these turbulent times. King Lear, Macbeth, Anthony, and Cleopatra. So what will you write? What are you writing during this time? So, you know, let that be some inspiration for you. During this time of pandemic, we're all shut in. We have a captive audience with one, of, one another. Even if it's just to do a table read or to, to do a reading, we, we have kids who are in school that are at home. So this is an opportunity maybe for those who write children's books to create a YouTube channel or to create some kind of outlet where parents who are at home with their children will have someplace else to go where they can go listen to a storyteller, story hour. So the opportunities are endless out there. And that's basically what I wanted to share today. Um, I would love for you guys to stay connected with me via social media. Here's my Facebook, um, 2SE Morgan. My public page is Stacy Evans Morgan. Uh, on Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Stacy Evans Morgan. And I have a new venture. I took a, a creative leap of my own and I started my own Patreon page because I wanted to create a space for creatives on a monthly basis where we can get together, we can do live Q and A's, we can do seminar Saturdays. We uh, will be doing, I'll be doing vlogs, um, pretty resourceful person. So I want to, you know, pull from the resources that I know that will come together and inspire people like you. So I'd love for you to check it out. It's, you know, $5 a month. It's a subscription base and um, we're going to be doing some really cool stuff. And, and my whole thing is I want to see writers and I want to see creatives evolve in, in what that calling is uh, because it was given to you for a purpose. And most recently we completed our first four week creative leap writers um, workshop. And I had experiences in that room from across the board from people who had written scripts to people who had never, did, didn't even know what it was to write a script. And lo and behold, by the fourth and final um, workshop, I had people hold up their scripts because people wrote first drafts. So these were, we had about 33 people from all over the country. And it was, it, it was so inspiring even for me. But to see these people, this woman is an Emmy Award winning, Kim Covington, an Emmy Award winning news journalist. This gentleman r runs the Film Society in Austin, Texas. This guy, you know him, uh, <laughs> Mr. Porcelli. This gentleman is the professor of screenwriting. I mean, we had so many different, this young lady wrote her first novel um, earlier, or it was published earlier this year. So many different experiences that came together. And um, lo and behold, now they've written their first drafts and they're going on and they're going to do rewrites and they're going to do something really wonderful. So needless to say, we've got another workshop coming up real soon. It'll be in the fall. And um, hopefully some of you will get to join us because we had a really wonderful time. And um, yeah, so that's, that's a little bit about me. Well, yay, everybody, I think we could give Stacy a round of applause here. <laughs> Congratulations on Thank such a, um, a great career so far. We know that there are a lot more things in your future. So I, I have a couple of questions um, yeah. that I wanted to uh, pose to you because um, you, you have had success. And the, I think um, for writers to sell to um, studios and streaming and even publishers, they, they, their writing has to have something unique or something that hooks people. Um, and I was uh, reading some uh, uh, reviews and things about uh, a good thing. And it seems to me that your character, you, you have such a strength in writing character. Um, so what goes into a Stacey Evans Morgan character? And I'm, what what do you do that hooks people? That's such a good, first of all, I am inspired by 
you know, I'm a people watcher. <laughs> I can go to a park and just watch people and try to imagine what their backstory is. And then I get inspired. I can watch a documentary. I can see a story on the news and, and try to take that person or that character and develop it further. I'm, I'm inspired by people who I've encountered in my life and, you know, by experiences that I've had. And how can I take some of these experiences and use my imagination to put them into other characters? The thing that sells at a studio, I will tell you, studios and networks, the thing that will sell is your character. You may not even have a fully developed premise, but you have an idea, you have a germ of an idea. But these characters, if your characters don't hook the executives, you can forget about it. So the characters and that story go hand in hand. So for me, for a good thing, it was loosely inspired by some experiences that have happened to me, but also to other women. And I kind of like pulled them all together and created this one character, Pilar Davenport and takes you on her adventures as she's learning. She's trying to learn the real meaning of love after what she thought was love wasn't. <laughs> so she kind of feels like she's spiraling out of control, but actually her life is falling right into place because now it's, a, it's an opportunity of self-exploration. Self and she really gets to know herself and learn that I didn't really know what love was. And now I'm ready and open to receive love. So that's a little bit about her character. Uh-oh, unmute. Maddie, you're muted. Yeah, unmute yourself, Maddie. <laughs> I know, people wish that would happen more often. Um, <laughs> I think when you were developing Pilar, did you had this adventure and maybe her journey in mind, but when you were developing her, or when you were developing, let's say, the characters in the um, sitcom that went on for 100 episodes, mm -hmm. how, what goes in when you, when you think about um, developing the character, aside from the story part, which is important, but the character itself, um, what goes into developing an interesting character that can sustain 100 episodes of a sitcom? That's a great what question. What do you put in that? Or, That's a great question. You have to think, what is, what is this character's story arc? Where do we, we know where we're starting and we don't necessarily know how it's going to end, but we, we have to have some idea of how we want this, this journey to end. So for example, for the Parkers, we had no idea of what Nikki Parker's journey was going to be. The show was a spinoff of the hugely popular series, um, changing my speaker view, of um, Moesha, right? And so this Nikki Parker character who was played by Monique, she um, was this single mother whose daughter was graduating from high school. And because she didn't finish college, she decided, yes, I'm going to go back to school. So now she, the whole premise of the show was she and her daughter were in college together. So, so they're both college freshmen. That was all we had in terms of what the show was going to be. Then we added into the mix this professor that she just had, she just fell in love with, Professor Ogilvy. So then that became another fun character that we were able to create for her um, in her pursuit of education. We didn't know all the details about Nikki Parker. But as a writer's room, as a team, that's where we were able to let our imagination go crazy. What's her backstory? Who's her ex-husband? You know, what happened? Um, is she gonna, she, we had an episode where she and her daughter were pledging the same sorority. I mean, you know, that's mortifying. I have a daughter who's a freshman in college who's starting her freshman year. That would be mortifying if, if, if I showed up at the same meeting, you know, can you imagine that? But we thought we could get a lot of funny. It's a comedy. So we got some funny out of that. And of course, she ended up dropping line because she was like, I'm not going to have these little whippersnappers up here trying to tell me what to do. But it was a, the opportunity came because of someone's real experience. One of the writers had pledged a grad chapter of a sorority 
And her mother pledged the same thing. Well, they're both professional women, so it was a different thing. They were joining this women's organization. But we just kind of took the spin on that story that these two women coming together to pledge a sorority, and we said, let's put it in an undergraduate situation and let the comedy go from there. So, um, so we knew that she had this crush on this professor. So somehow we knew if we last throughout the season, great. But if we last for 100 episodes, we know that we want to hopefully see that evolution of her relationship or her friendship with this, this professor who has nothing to do with, he doesn't want anything to do with her, that maybe we might see him turn the corner, that his, his affection for her might change. And we got a chance to explore that. So a lot of times you will, I created another project called AWAKA. It's, a, it's um, an acronym for a woman of certain age about a woman in her second act of life who uh, basically the pilot opens with her at, at her husband's funeral. And he was a, he was a <laughs> philandering person. <laughs> and um, we find out that she, he, owned, he, he owned an NBA team and in his will, he basically forgot to change her as her as the beneficiary from you know inheriting the ownership into the team because he was going to give it to his um, um, to his side chick basically uh, to his mistress. But he died, and so in, she ends up. But that be a lesson, right? Right. <laughs> so she ends up inheriting this NBA team, and. The whole idea was really kind of even inspired by shows like Golden Girls, these women in this next act of life coming to live under one roof. So she's got this big mansion in Atlanta and she's got three other friends who are going through their crazy dramas in their life. And, you know, I just thought that would be fun to see these four women living under one roof of this huge mansion and kind of checking off their bucket list and, and enjoying this next phase of life where their stories ultimately in, I don't know. But I just thought that's an interesting character for me. So I have characters all the time that are tapping me on the show, shoulder, shoulder like this going, hey, can you tell my story? And I'm sure all of you in the room experience that. I talk, right, <laughs> Pat Jackson's raising her. I, listen, I look like a crazy person because a lot of times I talk to myself, but I'm not talking to myself, I'm talking to these characters in my car, oh. My husband will walk in the room. He say, "Oh, you're having a conversation." Let me, you know. So that's what we do as writers, right? <laughs> I see people nodding their heads. So, uh, so when you're when you're putting together a pilot or a show, yes. and um, are you creating the show for um, a, a broad demographic? Are you creating it for um, people who have, let's say, uh, um, an for African Americans who have a certain experience and you're relating to that experience from their perspective? Are you creating a show that you say, okay, I'm, I think I want the most people, most eyeballs in the world to see and try and relate to. So how do you, or is there, does that go through your head at all? I don't really, you know, I, I so as an African American woman, I write from a perspective that I know, but I know a lot. I mean, I've had to assimilate you know, I know what it feels like to be the only black student in a, in a college classroom, in a lecture. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to be amongst, you know, my people. I know, you know, I've had, <laughs> I've had a lot of different experiences, but I write the human experience. I also know what it means to be a woman. So I'm in the, the presence of some really talented women. You know, I know what it means to write from the standpoint of being a mother, from being a wife, from being a sister. So, you know, from a cultural standpoint, you know, there's a little thing we like, you know, folks like to say, do it for the culture, do it for the culture. That means a lot. That's not just a black thing, a Latina thing, a white thing. It, it's do it for the culture. If you are a dancer, do it for the culture, you know, that, that circle of, of dancers, you know? Fame, the show Fame was about a school of performing arts, right? And so they got to tell their story from the standpoint of being artists. That was their culture. So there's a lot of different cultures that we can write from. So for me, um, I unapologetically 
like to write from the standpoint of being a black woman in America and my experience and being married to a Jamaican man and, and the encounters that I have, but I'm not limited to that. I don't like to be boxed in as a writer, as a TV writer, especially like, especially in the nineties, it's, it's evolved even more now, but it was, it was hard for writers of African-American heritage to get staffed on shows unless it was a show about African-American people. And I don't like to, I don't want to be just boxed in. You know, one of my friends got the opportunity to write on the show, Frasier. I loved Frasier. I loved Seinfeld. My first spec script that I wrote was Seinfeld. I knew everything about Seinfeld. I knew that show. And that very script ended up opening the doors for me to get accepted into the Warner Brothers Writers Program because I wrote the show exactly how I thought Jerry Seinfeld and his team would write it. And it got the attention of executives and things of that sort. But yet and still, I was not being considered for a lot of shows that maybe didn't have anybody of color. But I can write those stories too, you know, from the human experience. But times have changed. That picture that I showed you of the 26 women, that's a great example of how times have changed because I, we can write everything. We, you know, we all, we're writers. We are a special group. We are the storytellers, <laughs> right? So, so, so I have a question too. I mean, there, um, what, what advice do you give um, uh, white writers who include uh, people of color in their stories and writing those characters and um, uh, trying to do it with authenticity and um, create genuine characters? Yeah, that's a great question. Just write, write it from a human standpoint. Don't worry so much about the colloquialisms and, and you know, the, you, you know what? That's where you need to network and tap, get you a good black friend and say, read this and <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> seriously. So network with other writers. And don't be afraid, read it out loud. How does it sound to you? Because at the end of the day, we all say, we all talk the same. You know, I, I worked on a show and I was the assistant to the head writer. And it was a, it was a show about four African-American single women called Living Single, right? And this one of, one of the writers, he came out of the writer's room and he asked me, and I don't think he, he, he was just like, Stacey, what's a really cool way to say, Let's like say, hey, hey, let's party. And I was like this, hey, let's party. <laughs> or hey, let's let's go to this party. Don't don't overthink it. And you know, please, by all means, take a stab at it. I mean, if I were I'm a big fan of the show Rami, right? And so the show about this Muslim American and you know that on Hulu. I don't have a clue as to how to write for a Muslim American, but you can, we have this great thing called the internet. We can do the research and, and talk to people and let people in on what you're trying to do, people that you trust. And yeah, I hope that answered that question. Yeah, no, you did. A, I think you did a great job on that. So we have a question that says, how can writers who don't have a writing team find ways to brainstorm and come up with more creative ideas when it's just you? Um, okay, say it again. How can writers? How can writers who don't have like a write, who don't come into a writing room, yeah. um, brainstorm to come up with creative ideas on their own? Do you have okay, any so, suggestions? So this is a great, right here, this is a great resource. Look at all these writers in here. There's, there's someone that you will connect with just in this group. But social media is a great outlet as well. So let's just say you want to put together a local group a comedy writing group or a sci-fi group. Any takers, if you put the word out there, someone's gonna bite, right? And then maybe you decide, hey, let's meet up at a cafe or let's meet on Zoom. <laughs> and let's just talk about what it is we wanna write. And maybe from that group of eight, you might identify four that you feel like you could really write with. So, I mean, that's a great question but the opportunities are there and again during this time of pandemic what great we have a great opportunity to network with other writers 
you know, with my group, with the creative leap, um, you know, I'm glad some of them are here because I think we as writer groups, we need to connect. We need to mix it up, you know, <laughs> not just culturally, but even demographic age wise and things of that sort. Let's mix it up. Let's share each other's experience because there's a lot of power in that. Okay, great. Um... I'm looking here. I see a lot of comments on how amazing you are. Yay. Oh, oh, uh, thank you. And uh, inspiring. Um, so I, I think that um, Larry said many of us are in writers and critique groups. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we had the cozy critters. We had our own cozy mystery group kind oh. of spin off out of there, okay. um, which is now kind of taken, a life, taken on a life of its own, Karen. Um, Sherry. Um, so I think um, that's great advice. Okay, we had a couple of things now. Um, does it, before I move on to the game show portion of our uh, production, uh, does anybody have any more questions for um, Stacy before we let her off the hot seat? Please, I'm here for you. So answer, okay. ask the questions. All right. Um, okay, so we're going to be um, giving away. Um, five. Someone uh, else popping on the screen with Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> five um, uh, of copies of Stacy's book, A Good Thing, um, and we're going to do it like a very in a very scientific way because we want to be fair um, and equitable. So first of all, in order to play, you have to agree if you do receive one of her books um, that you're going to review it. So if you're not interested in reviewing it, um, you can drink your coffee and enjoy what comes <laughs> next. Um, but if you are, get ready. So we're gonna, we have five copies to give away. We're gonna give away um, those copies to the first five people who type their name in the chat room right now. <laughs> Let's see how fast people type. Nancy, Tanya. Nancy, Tanya, Lena, Shara, and Kara. Sharon and Kara. I think we got five, right? Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, those are our five. Congratulations. Uh, and and uh, Larry and I are going to hopefully meet up soon. So I'm going to sign those books. So I will sign them for you. Someone was asking the question uh, about Patreon. And I'm so, oh, Karen was holding up her copy. Thank you, Karen. I'm so glad someone um, asked that question because Patreon is, um, it's an op it's a platform by which you can have your own subscribers and you and and I'm creating content I'm creating blogs I'm creating mini seminars and it's a subscriber based type situation you can you can jump off at any time but it's basically a way to keep an ongoing community of creatives going just like what we're doing but I'm actually putting together um guest speakers on a monthly basis. I'm doing blogs. I, you know, if in the middle of the weeks an opportunity comes, I'm going to share it exclusively with my Patreon group. I mean, we might be, we might do a scene writing seminar, a Saturday scene writing seminar. Those are the types of things. So Patreon just kind of supports me as I try to create uh, content for you. Thank you, Stacy. No, well, thank you guys. Thank you Great. so much. This has been awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We're, we're grateful and um, we are going to be putting the, your information up on our webpage, okay. uh, on a Facebook page. So if anybody is interested um, in learning about the creative, taking a creative leap, <laughs> we can um, give them that information. Um, and we wish you best of luck Thank on you everything so that you're doing in Thank the future. Um, and hopefully you'll come back and stay in touch and let us know what's happening. I would love to come back and hopefully it's going to be when we can get in traffic and come down and have, you know, the old, the old school way. But this has been great. Thank you guys so much for having me. This has been a blast. And, yeah. and, and before um, I turn it over to Larry to close, I just want to remind everybody that next month we have um, Hank Felipe Ryan. Uh, she's a novelist. She's also a reporter in Boston. Um, she's won 37 Emmys for her news reporting. Um, she is a, a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, her latest, um, the, the First to Lie, has just come out. And she's going to be talking to us about how to write the first page. Because if you're trying to sell your book, 
and agents are looking through it, if, if they get through your synopsis and your query, it goes first line, right? Then it goes the second line and the third line and how to keep them and hook them in the first page. So um, she's going to be talking about um, how to write the first page. She did that in Thriller Fest. Um, I heard her do that in Thriller Fest in New York City, which I paid a lot more money for. Um, um, but she, it's a great um, seminar. So we're lucky enough to have her. So she'll be here on um, September 19th. So we have um, that to look forward to as well. Okay, Larry, I'm done. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, you see the uh, people we're helping. And today, by the way, Stacy, we not only will eventually put it up on our site, but we also categorize one of our writers, Glenda, takes what you've said today from your own story to what you answered in the questions of characterization and everything and synopsizes them and puts them out uh, monthly in a newsletter. So everybody can also read that oh, and wow. hear what, what you said, you know, so your words uh, stay with us forever and ever. And uh, that's the story with writers. We also have something going on we didn't uh, mention, but we do want to mention it here because we have the people and um, we've gone over and, and uh, but the, um, we have a submission asking on the web for, we're putting together a book, you know, uh, two and a half years ago, we published an anthology of short stories. Well, we're going to do another one of short stories, extremely short, 250 word short stories. Um, and this one, last time we selected, I believe it was 12 or 15 short stories, but they were full length. This is short stories and you must accompany them with a recipe. And uh, we only put the recipe hook in there just because it was a time we were all stuck home. But the book isn't a, a recipe book or how grandma made this. It's a literary exposition. Mm -hmm. So we, as we did the last one, we will do this one classy and with full uh, publication. And it will be available on the web. It'll be available ebook and it'll be available um, as a hard book. So look us up on the web. Nancy Clan, where are you? If she's here still. I know she was going into a, yeah, where are you? I'm Say here. hello. Summer she of is. Love, that's Nancy. I'm <laughs> excited about that one, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. Nancy um, is such a humorist, I got to say. She is, if you ever just see a few words, she could make you laugh in three words, you know, some of the things she juxtaposes and puts up on the web, so. But she's yeah, the editor for that. And I, yeah, I love your Facebook. You're just. And that clothes, look at, show Stacy that dress, that fabulous oh, dress. Oh, Larry, come on. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, does make things. Uh, so it is there, look it up on the web. It's asked for submissions on our website, right on the uh, Southern Cal Writers Org. We thank you again for today. We, and we have you, extended, we've extended the, oh, right, um, the deadline. The deadline to September, th the end of September. Right, for submissions. And that being, as Nancy pointed out to me, we don't want first draft. We want your final draft of your story. You know, uh, so um, send us the story. You know, just look up the one that we published and you'll see the top quality where we had the head of the Steinbeck Center in um, Salinas. She even wrote the uh, blurb for the cover because she was so impressed with the quality of the writing in it. And we sold it at the Steinbeck Center. Uh, uh, for a while. So um, thank you again for being here today. If we've missed anything or any person, I totally apologize. We thank you, Stacy, for being with us. And, you know, you just walk away inspired because we just, you know, you get, get us going because your story ca is contagious and gets to us. And then to hear your words of wisdom about something, you know, it's just phenomenal. So I love it. Be be intentional, guys. As writers, be intentional. Get out of your comfort zone. Meet people that you normally don't know or don't talk to. And you find out we have the same human experiences. And then that's going to inspire you as writers. So, yeah. And I hope to see some of you in the in the workshop in the fall. So, it'll be great. And again, we are going to offer a scholarship to that. And you'll hear more about that uh, coming up soon. Wow, nice. So, <laughs> on how, how we so select someone. Thank you very much again. Any final announcements that I missed? Maddie? I think we're good. Anything? Uh, Diana? Do we miss anything? Pamela? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Uh, thank you again. Uh, go forth and write and uh, sell, Mortimer. Sell! Sell, uh, Mortimer!